Welcome to the Holy Smokes Podcast, a show about faith, friendship, fine tobacco, and drink. I'm Steve Ryder here in Brooklyn, New York, with somebody who I have known since college when he was hanging out with my brother back in high school, Jason Storbakken, who is the pastor of Manhattan Mennonite Fellowship in New York City. And also, what's your position with the Bowery Mission? The Director of Spiritual Formation. The Director of Spiritual Formation. We'll, we'll get more into that and what Bowery is and all of that in a little bit. But the first question I start out every episode with, what you smoking? Smoking a nitro. Nice. Ultra. A nitro ultra, yeah. Yeah, Lucione Ultra. Lucione, yeah. Tell me a little bit about what I'm smoking. Yeah, so the, uh, Howard from... Illusioni Cigars sent out a bunch, and uh, that was their highest rated cigar that they sent. Really? Um, yeah, I think Cigar Aficionado Magazine named it a top 25 cigar wow. for 2015, maybe? 2016? It's smooth and, uh, and flavorful, <clears throat> that's for sure. It's a beautiful stick. I had one uh, during my interview, I believe, with James Anderson from uh, New Canaan Society, and I've, I've had a Holy Smokes listener who I took out to dinner when they were in Colorado Springs, he had one of those as well, and he loved it. Mm. So, And then I got a Cohiba Bejique. And uh, so I've got a a connection that got me a box of Cohibas from Cuba, and uh, so this is my first one out of that box that I'm smoking. I brought one for you if you wanted it, but you said you liked how I talked about that Illusione. So Jason, you are an author. Uh, You've written a book called Radical Spirituality. And uh, just came out with a new book about the Bowery Mission. Before we get to Bowery and what the Bowery Mission is, talk about where you grew up and uh, your background, because you have an interesting story. I grew up in Wisconsin. I was born in Janesville, Wisconsin. My parents were very young when they had me. You said your mom was 16 and your dad was 15. They were. They're, that's really young. Really young. That's really young. My uh, father did propose marriage to my mother but she said what will you support me with um your paper route and i guess she kind of knew that it would be very difficult even at that age i mean it didn't at that age to get married and and raise me so she went it alone but my father was always present in my life i grew up knowing him very well and being raised by a single mom you know lower economic status, moving around from trailer parks to subsidized apartment to sharing uh, spaces and duplexes with roommates and all. We moved a total of 20 times by the time I was 17. Uh, You said Partyville, the town that I grew up in, and you finished high school at where you and my brother Neil were very close. Yeah. Party buddies. Yeah, (laughs) Partyville. Party Buddies in Partyville. Yeah. Um, Which is the actual name yes, of this small town in yes, Wisconsin. Yes, it's Pardeeville, D-E-E. Yeah. And, uh, but you and Neil were into a lot of stuff back in the day. We were. We were. Yeah, so Partyville, <clears throat> I lived there for three years, which is the longest I lived anywhere apart from Janesville, which is where I was born, um, until I moved to Brooklyn. I've been here 15 years. Yeah. And yeah, so I I knew Neil. He was a year older than me. Uh, Still one of the coolest guys I know. And uh, we got into a whole bunch of stuff. I know he went out to Colorado when I was a senior in high school, and we corresponded through letters. And when he moved back and I went traveling out west, and then I moved back, we ended up being roommates for a solid year before I left the country and began my my international travels. So in reading your book, Radical Spirituality... You had a strong desire to learn about God and attacked that from a whole lot of different angles and faith belief systems, etc. Talk about that because growing up in a single parent home to a very young mom, I would have thought you to have been someone that was very agnostic, angry at the world, but that apparently wasn't the case. Yeah, I always say I get my faith from my mom and my religion from my paternal grandparents. So 
my mom was always a hopeful person, not religious. We went to church just a handful of times, her and I. Yeah, but she had what they call today a growth mindset. Like she saw possibilities mm-hmm. in places where others wouldn't see them. Yeah. So she modeled that for me from a young age. I saw her like face adversity and obstacles and overcome them. I saw her so tender and broken sometimes and yet rise up and do better than she had ever imagined that she would do the year or five years earlier. Yeah. So I witnessed this with my mom. And then my dad's parents, my grandparents, they devout Baptists, you know, in, in Wisconsin. And my grandfather comes from a long line of Anabaptists, Mennonites, Hutterites, pacifist Christians. And he would tell us the stories of our ancestors about how there were martyrs and and how they suffered and were persecuted for their faith for centuries and how they nonviolently resisted war in Europe and even in the United States. And then he would say, but I don't have those convictions. He was a veteran. He went to yeah. Korean War and all of this. But he found it important to share those stories with me. And little did he know he was turning me into a Mennonite because I had those values from a young age. I was like... Oh, nonviolence seems obvious yeah. in a world where you want peace and healthy relationships. Yeah. So I got the religious framework from my grandfather, who was not a preacher. He always said that his spiritual gift or calling was to be a bold witness for the gospel. And he was. He shared the good news everywhere he went. So I think those two worlds coming together, it just kind of made a magical combination in a sense <laughs> where I was able to, to make sense of it all. And also, I'd say my mom's vulnerability and like authenticity challenged me to really lean into faith and religion from a very honest place, mm. which is, I think, where we all hopefully seem to enter into it. But we end up wearing masks and other things, and we still do throughout our whole life. But because of my mom's, I guess, witness... Um, it challenges me to say, wait, am I just wearing a pastor's mask right now? Or am I actually seeking to walk with the Christ and live out a life that embodies love for those who suffer and hurt? Yeah. yeah. So talk a little bit about Anabaptists, Mennonites, because I've heard about the uh, Anabaptists over the years. And your book kind of explains it a little bit more, but I'm sure that there are people yeah. that they're like, oh, what? A ba- ba- Anabaptist? So the word Anabaptist is actually a derogatory term originally, but then they owned it. They kind of redeemed it. It means to rebaptize. I think it was about 1525 or so in Switzerland, if I'm not mistaken. It was uh, kind of a, a religious state, mm-hmm. right? And they were trying to live out this new way, this Protestantism, you know, this stuff uh-huh. that Luther and Calvin were putting into place. And then there were some of what later became called Anabaptists who were like, yeah, we want to go a little deeper. We believe what you're saying is true, but we're not seeing it because we still see a lot of clerical authority, even though Luther's talking about a priesthood of all believers. So... They took literally what the reformers were speaking and writing about. Yeah. And so they rebaptized themselves. But in those days, it's very different. Now it's a big deal. You know, believer's baptism. Yeah. When you're at the age of consent or accountability, then you are baptized, according to many traditions now. Mm-hmm. But back then, in the 16th century in Europe, because these states and the church were wedded together, when you were rebaptized, it was in a sense like you were tearing up your baptismal certificate, which was also your birth certificate. So when you were baptized into the church, you were also baptized into the state. So they were deemed anarchists and subversives. <laughs> plus, plus, they stopped paying war taxes. They paid school taxes. Mm. They paid road taxes, whatever, whatever taxes they had, 
But they said, we're not going to pay military taxes. Plus, they didn't join the military because they said, Jesus says to love your enemies. Mm -hmm. I think he means it. So we're going to lay down arms and we'll be like, you know, sheep and droves led to the slaughter, if so be it. And that's what happened. They ended up being persecuted by the Calvinists, the Lutherans, by the Catholics, but not even so much as they were persecuted by the Protestants. And it was all because of their embodiment of these Protestant teachings. Mm. That's kind of the short of it. Yeah. Oh. So your grandfather had a lot of influence and a lot of spoke a lot about this into your life that really kind of gave you planted that seed but yet during high school you were looking elsewhere reading stuff that i remember when i read it in your book i was like wow that's impressive for a high school kid in partyville wisconsin to be reading this stuff yeah i was exposed to it from a young age i was always just an avid reader and i think it was about i don't know the age of 15 Maybe it just moved to Partyville. And I read a uh, biography on the doors. No one here gets out alive. Yeah. And I'd already been reading some beat literature, which opened me up to a whole new world. Jack Kerouac and Bill Burroughs and, and uh, Allen Ginsberg and all of these guys were just opening up, to, opening me up to like Buddhist thought and ideas of being a pilgrim. Jack Kerouac was a Catholic and is like seeking to be a pilgrim yeah. throughout his life. And Arthur Rimbaud, some of the French symbolist poets. So they began to open up my whole world. Like, And having moved around a lot, even though it's always small town Wisconsin, you get to see little nuances of different cultures in each town, from Poinette to Partyville to the Forest to West Bend. It's all over it. Every place has its own kind of distinct flavor. And so that had already kind of marinated in me or seasoned me a little bit to yeah. be right to enter into these other kind of learnings I guess you might say so once you finished high school which was barely <laughs> there was a the bottom of my class they had a bunch of suspensions I, they tried to expel me they had an expulsion hearing for me um, what'd you do? it all piled up okay. you know some fights which I was a pacifist, but moving around, and I was from like the age of 15, I believed in nonviolence, but I just wasn't a good pacifist. <laughs> and, um, and being the perpetual new kid, you just end up getting in a lot of fights. You're targeted, you're marked really quick. And I've always had a hard time kind of fitting in for some reason a little bit. And um, we went to Jamaica when my mom got married. She said, if you get all bees, you can uh, come with us on our honeymoon. What a, what a great mom and what an amazing stepdad to say that, you yeah, know. Yeah. And I got all A's, you know, which is amazing, right? Came back, I ended up getting all D's, with some F's. But I also came back and I had all these shirts. And it'd be like Bob Marley shirts. And they'd have like marijuana on it, stuff like that, or Red Stripe. Yeah. And I remember Partyville High School had a pretty strong no alcohol or drug clothing yes. rule. Yeah. And I just kept wearing it. And so I remember that was a big issue for them. And so I forget it. Oh, I do remember what it was. I got into a fight with, you know who he is. I probably shouldn't. Let's hear it. Let's hear it. I can can edit it if needed. Right on. Fred Octoberg. Oh, yeah. Freddy. Freddy. Yeah, Yeah. I remember Freddy. Yeah. We got into a fight. And um, it was a big fight. And there was a pocket knife that fell out of my pocket. Fell out of my pocket. Yeah. And one guy, I think it was Dennis. I can't remember his last name, but I think we're Facebook friends Hartman? now. Yeah. Okay. Like, he pulled a knife. And I'm like, no. Pulled a knife. I'm like, no, I didn't. It was the cover of the, the Daily Register. But because we were too young, they didn't put names in. Yeah. And all this craziness. And it really blew up. <laughs> and they're like, you know, you're going you're gonna to be expelled. And... um. They kept me in by one vote. And if I'm not mistaken, Fred's dad was the chair of the... Um, his uncle, School Chuck. board. Yeah, the his school, uncle. Yeah, his, his uncle, uncle. Chuck. Yeah. I remember it was some kind of connection. Yeah. And I was like, oh, this isn't going to go over well. Yeah. But I got to stay in by one vote. Yeah. And um, I remember feeling so horrible. 
back then in my juvenile mind, I was like, I can't believe they made my mom cry. Looking back, it's like, no, I made my mom cry by subjecting her to that, you know? But then I, I did finish at the bottom of my class. It was a very small class, class of, yeah. I think, 48 students. And, um, I like 47. 95, right? 1995, yeah. Yeah, the class of 95. Yep. So just barely graduated. And two weeks later, I left home and went out west and just began traveling. Where out west? The first place was Estes Park, the gateway to the Rocky Mountains. Oh, yeah. And um, went up there and just uh, went to the Rocky Mountain uh, Mountain Climbing School because it was a cheap place to stay. I didn't do any real mountain climbing. It was more of a hostel. I stayed there for a while. Yeah. Um, got a job at the Lazy R Cottages. Drove their Ford Bronco 2 around illegally because I didn't have my license. I was kind of their handyman until they realized I'm not much of a handyman. Then I was the housekeeping guy for yeah. a little while. Yeah. And, um, yeah, then I went down to New Mexico and out to California, and I was still 17 years old, and then just hitchhiked all over the American West, and uh, came back at the end of the summer and took a job at the Cheese Factory, like a good Wisconsinite. Like a good Wisconsin boy. So you were really into drugs in high school and even after high school. Where did that take you? So I really like smoking marijuana and mushrooms and a little acid, you know, and, or a lot yeah. when I was around. And it was funny because I wanted to do it earlier than I did it. I started when I was like 15 mm-hmm. in Partyville. And I couldn't find it. Like when I was 13 or 14, I couldn't find people who... Uh, were experimenting. Mm-hmm. I found it in Partyville. Sadly, I heard like the whole meth, amphetamine, opioid crisis is really hitting around the like, Portage, yeah. Columbia County, Wisconsin right now. Gladly, it was not there then. Yeah. So everything I was doing was non-addictive. It's like weed and mushrooms. Yeah. And maybe someone would have like cocaine but it was probably flour <laughs> mixed in with something yeah but yeah so i was reading you know arthur rambo i was reading um, all of these kind of like experimental artists and poets and writers and they were doing all of these things so i was feeling in a sense i am not pleased with the reality that i've been dealt this is not easy hmm. moving around a lot mm-hmm. single mom poor like i wanted to disrupt that reality and i wanted to find a new way to enter in and in the short term firing up a big fast bliff was a way for me to kind of recalibrate yeah and so i did that for for a number of years and i'll be honest i don't regret it i hope my children don't go down that path i don't think that they'll need to yeah but it opened me up to kind of see things in a new way. I mean, to be honest, I know I wasn't considered the best influence. Many parents were not allowing their children to hang out with me. That's why I'm so thankful for uh, your parents, although they might not have allowed it either, but Neil just... <laughs> they, <laughs> yeah, my, yeah, my mom and dad didn't know. I mean, they knew kind of what Neil was up to and you guys were up to, but they kind of relied on their experience as parents and the values that they instilled and kind of gave us gave us both the freedom to be able to uh, make our own mistakes. There's a lot of wisdom in that. While still, to make those mistakes while we were still at home. Yeah, so he was a good buddy because he was a little more mature than me. He had some really well-established values. I had some, but they were way over in a distance and I was trying to figure them out. Yeah. So yeah, he was always a gave me inspiration when he moved out to Colorado you know for that year and stuff it's like oh man he's doing it he's living that life that I'm dreaming about (laughs) you know what's funny though is when Neil went out to Colorado I didn't get the whole mystique of Colorado now you're there for 20 some years now I've been there for 22 years but at the time I was like the Broncos are there freaking John Elway what a (laughs) douchebag I was like I don't want no I don't Denver, Colorado. See, but and they're like snowboarding. 
They're yeah, like, we're yeah, going oh, yeah. He, he, yeah. Neil was in with that crowd, well, like with Harmon and Rostad and those guys right. that were all big into snowboarding and the mountain lifestyle. Yeah, and that wasn't me. I mean, I, I took a job at Cascade Mountain, which for those that don't know, it's it's a ski hill, hill right. outside of Portage, Wisconsin, and that's it's a hill, pretty good size hill. But yeah, it's a, yeah, it's, but a, it's, it's a hill. It's, it's a good size hill for Wisconsin. Yes, <laughs> for Wisconsin. Right. But I wasn't into that culture. And so, yeah, when Neil went out to Colorado, I just didn't get it. I yeah. didn't. And then I came out to meet my, at the time, girlfriend. And I just, I fell in love. And I, I fell in love just for the hiking and just the outdoor stuff. And yeah. And uh, so anyway, you Estes Park, out west, back in Portage. Why'd you come back to Wisconsin? It was time. I make some money. I turned 18. And um, figured that... Uh, I should save up some money and do a big trip. What was that big trip you wanted to do? See the world. Okay. So moved back to Portage, worked at the Association of Milk Producers Incorporated, making some cheese, and um, saved $100 a week from my check for almost a year. Lost a bunch of it at the Ho-Chunk Casino. <laughs> thought, thought I was going to make a bunch of money, but no, I lost a bunch of money there. <laughs> But I ended up having about... Oh, to be a kid and think you can do that system. <laughs> I know. And um, so I bought a ticket from uh, Chicago O'Hare to Heathrow Airport in London. And I never used my return ticket. Yeah. I just kept traveling until I came back to Wisconsin a roundabout way. Yeah. Made it the whole way around the world, little by little, over a course of a year. So you ended up in India... Yeah, so I was in London, and I was burning through my money, and I was being pretty frugal. I was like, I don't know how I'm going to survive, you know, with my money dwindling. And I saw some Hare Krishna. I was a kid. I just turned 19. Yeah. And these guys were kids, too. And I was like, I bet they're staying somewhere, and uh, they've probably got a pretty sweet deal going on. So I went up to these Hare Krishna selling their books and I said uh, where you guys staying you know and they told me about the the Govinda temple in Soho London and I made my way down there stayed there for a little more than a month and then I would stay at Hare Krishna temple sometimes as I traveled around Europe and Paris and in Madrid and finally I was like I'm going to India I mean that's where you know Hare Krishna originates plus my dad's big sister has been a missionary to the deaf with her husband and children since the year I was born. Mm. So I had multiple reasons to go there. Yeah. And um, made my way there, saved a little money, asked my grandma for a little bit of help, you know. Well, because you're going to go see your uncle. Yes, <laughs> you know. So she was all in. Missionary uncle, yes. of, of all things. And I'm hanging out with pagans, you know, yeah. according to my all my family. They're like, oh, you know, this is horrible. So they're glad to, to send me to India. Yeah. And um, I've been in, I was in Europe about six months and made my way to India and I was there for six months. Because I've always liked to read, I read like with the Hare Krishna, the Mahabharata, the Ramayana, the Srimad Bhagavatam, the Sri Chaitanya Chaitamrita, like some ancient texts, Upanishads, Isopanishads, all sorts of like primary sources of like Hindu culture yeah. which were just fascinating and were speaking to me in a lot of ways how really, so like you can do a lot of theology with the cosmology that has been created from the Indian subcontinent I mean they have 66 million deities and you know ultimately they would say they're not pantheistic they are panentheistic if you dig in deep enough to it, which would make them almost monotheistic. If you really drive that theological line, I mean, that's where you can end up. So it's just interesting, all the works that they were doing, some of it did not resonate with me. I've never felt uh, that I have a belief in reincarnation. Mm -hmm. I've always believed that this is my first life and it's great, wonderful, you know? Mm -hmm. What a gift to be alive in this moment. So they would say stuff like, oh, what many faces you've had. And I would think, this is my original face. <laughs> this is what I got, you yeah. know? 
but there were other things that really didn't resonate like not to be critical but growing up and you know in school you studied Greek mythology and all of that kind of felt so distant and far removed almost mythological in a certain sense not to diminish the experience of any Hindus who are having a authentic experience with God through that vehicle but it was not resonating with me and it seemed so distant mm. Mm. and when I got to India my uncle who you know fundamentalist Christian Mm -hmm. um, doing amazing work with the deaf and with the lepers, he was not proselytizing me, which I welcomed. I had to ask him for a Bible. I was like, man, one of these people going to hand me a Bible. You know, I was <laughs> waiting for it. You know, I was a little guarded maybe even. Yeah. yeah. And I said, Uncle Bruce, can I have a Bible? He said, yeah, of course. He goes, all I want to ask is if uh, when you read it, start with the gospel, start with the New Testament. And I was reading it and I was like, oh, wow. This is very real, like with the Christian scriptures, the New Testament, the teachings like about the widows and the orphans and the fatherless and things like that. And I was reading it from my own context. So when it said fatherless, I have a father, but I understood it also to be children with single moms. It's like, oh, this mm -hmm. is like for me as well. Mm -hmm. Jesus saying, I've come to, you know, preach good news to the poor set the captives free, liberate the oppressed, bind up the brokenhearted. It's like, man, this is like real teachings that are applicable to our lived experience now. It's not this kind of like escapist fantasy, although it can tend in that direction at times yeah. as well. Yeah. Um, but it spoke to me. And so I left Southern India because it was, it was getting a little too real for me. I was like, oh, this Jesus. <laughs> just, just get, let's, I gotta, I gotta go. I gotta get away from my Christian family's influence, and I gotta wrestle with this stuff on my own. And it was around Christmas time, so I got a couple hundred bucks from family, and I took a, oh, I don't know how far it is, but at least a thousand mile journey from Uti, or also called Udigamandalam, it's a hill station in Tamil Nadu, a southern state in India, mm -hmm. and I traveled three days by train couple days by bus and then um, I had to walk a little bit and I was in the Himalayas mm. and I began to um, read the Bible there the Old Testament the Hebrew scriptures and it really just began to open up my life in a way and like minister to my soul like a balm of healing that mm. I had been yearning for so long mm. in a sense it began to make make sense of a lot of things and it provided me that new reality that I'd been hoping for. So I went back down to uh, Tamil Nadu and I told my Uncle Bruce I want to be baptized. And it was getting closer to Easter then and he said alright let's do it on Easter Sunday. And so I was baptized in, in, uh, on Easter Sunday 1997. 1997. I gotta get better at keeping this thing going. <laughs> and then um I came back to the States with a zeal, with a zeal for the Lord. And um, I was so disillusioned and disheartened. I should have known. I'd gone to church with family as a kid. But I had an experience in India that was very life-giving. And I started going to church, you know, back in Wisconsin. And it was all like very middle-class you know, it was very specific social strata. Churchianity is what I call it. Yeah, and I didn't fit in. Plus, little did I know, and my grandpa would not have approved, but his teachings about our Anabaptist forebears had already begun to take root, and I would see, like, an American flag in the sanctuary. And while I love this country, I know that God loves every country. I'd been baptized in India. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden, I begin to see this kind of God and country theology that to my newborn being seemed to quench the movement of what the Spirit was doing in my life. Mm -hmm. Plus, I was very young and immature, and I wanted to go back to sinning and womanizing and doing drugs. And I was still at, you know, earliest 20s. 
Mm -hmm. And so I, I'd left, I left the church, you know. I wish I didn't leave Jesus though. During that time, like, I still held on to like Jesus's teachings, although I didn't practice them so fully. Mm -hmm. But I believed in like his teachings on love and forgiveness and those universal teachings were still resonating with me. But I was a kid and I was, I mean, even in my 20s and even now in my early 40s, I have a lot of maturing to do, you know. So just thinking over 20 years ago, how far of a road I had before me. Yeah. So you ended up not giving up the drugs completely and somehow you ended up in a South Korean prison. I sure did. Talk about that. Yeah, so I went back, got baptized in India, made my, my way back to Wisconsin, lived with my dad for two years and went to University of Wisconsin, Rock County, okay. because I couldn't get into any other school. But that was a great school, little UW Community College. Did well, went there for two years. Took a year off, went to South America, traveled for six months throughout South America. All sorts of harrowing adventures in South America. Went Where back. in South America? I was in Peru, Bolivia, Chile, Argentina, Ecuador, Brazil, Paraguay, Colombia. Everywhere except for Venezuela. Everywhere but Venezuela and the Guyanas. Mm. I went to uh, all the other countries. Yeah. Hitchhiking, traveling around. It was a wild time. I was Do you speak there. Spanish? A little, un poquito. Okay. I spoke it much better then because I had studied Spanish every semester for two years, and then I went to South America immediately. I was, I was I okay. Was you were able to get around. Yeah, I was. Yeah. And um, after that, went back to Wisconsin, finished up an international studies degree at, at Madison, UW yeah. Madison. Yeah. And um, oh yeah, just I traveled. I'd worked for some railroad companies for four years seasonally was living in North Africa for a while in Morocco and ran out of money and a friend said you should go teach English in South Korea I said doesn't sound like a bad idea to me <laughs> so I applied and literally from the date of my application submission it was six days later that I arrived in South Korea oh my god a little too quick I think yeah I mean too quick on their part. I mean, they really needed teachers, I guess. But I should have discerned a little more, too. And so I went there, and I was teaching English in a hagwon. I was Jason teacher for three months. And there was a, another teacher there, a Korean teacher. And he was smoking hashish. And he says, uh, he goes, hey, you want to smoke, smoke some? I'm like, yeah, let's smoke, you know. And so I would smoke with him on occasion. I never bought it. I never bought it there or anything. I was just in too close a proximity. And yeah. come to find out, he was actually basically trafficking drugs with some Russians who were like the middlemen and bringing it in from Thailand. So he was like way up there. Yeah. And he got busted. One of the packages was intercepted. And they did what's called a dragnet, like the old show Dragnet. Mm -hmm. They did a dragnet. They went through a cell phone got all of the English teachers together and drug tested us and because they have a zero tolerance drug policy they um, threw any of us who had a little bit of THC in our system into the Gucci cell into the prison yeah. and so I was there for about three months I was the only American in my prison I was in a foreigner cell so I was with Mongolians Iranians Nigerians and ethnic Koreans from China. I remember I saw one guy and he w this was at the immigration detention center when they were about to deport me back to yeah. Wisconsin. Yeah. And he was uh, he was reading something in English and I hadn't spoken much English with folks for a couple months. And I said, hey, you know, my name's Jason. He goes, oh, I'm innocent. I said, brother, we're all innocent come to find out that's his name he's from Nigeria <laughs> and it's a popular name in Nigeria but uh, yeah so you know part of my faith journey and my return to faith was while sitting in that prison cell I petitioned the guards for a Bible and they gave me a Bible and I was reading the story of Judges and I came to Jephthah who just has a tragic story but a lot of what he experienced resonated with me he was the oldest son 
his mother was considered a harlot or an outcast. So all of the other siblings were like, we got to get rid of Jeff Duh. He's going to get the inheritance. And so he goes out on his own, kind of goes rogue. And depending on what translation of the Bible you're reading, he gathers either adventurers or bandits around him. And he's a leader. Mm -hmm. And his brothers say, we need help because we're being dominated by other cultures. I forget who it was, Philistines or Canaanites or some, someone. Amorites. Yeah, whatever. Hittites. I don't yeah, know. Someone yeah. was giving them a hard time. Yeah. And uh, they asked their big brother to come back and help them out. And he reclaims 18 villages and all of this. And he is essentially restored. And I was like, oh, his story of redemption and restoration is so powerful. He makes a horrible decision at the end and does a child sacrifice. And that's a twist that I don't want to apply to my life. But um, but his journey, for some reason, in that prison cell, I was like, man, if Jephthah can get it together, maybe I can get it back together, wow. too. Wow. So he came back to the U.S.? Depressed. Went really? back to Madison, yeah. Just, I have a pretty joyful disposition in general. But going through that really just uh, kind of broke me. And I probably could have been diagnosed as clinically depressed in that season. Yeah. And I had a couple friends who'd moved out to Brooklyn. Uh, my buddy Casey Munz, who's a high school math teacher just a couple blocks from here. And my buddy Shane Welch, who founded Six Point Craft Ales, a uh, local brewery yeah. in New York City. They said, come out to Brooklyn. There's a lot going on here. And I came out to Brooklyn. I became the roving reggae reporter for High Times, which was the marijuana yeah. magazine. And I started doing stuff for other magazines, Vibe, and mostly music reviews. I liked music, so I was you know, selling articles, um, reviews of new CDs. The CDs were still kind of a thing, mm -hmm. you know. And I was, on a, I was on the A train going up to meet with one of my editors. And I was between Delancey and High Street and a subway preacher got on there. Mm -hmm. Normally, I'd turn off, you know, whatever they're saying because yeah. oh, a bunch of, you know, religious crackpots. But this guy really started speaking some truth. And I felt like it was just, just not even him and me. It was like just the spirit in me. It felt like the whole car was saturated with God's presence. Hmm. And that's really, I mean, there's a lot of theologies around spirit baptism. And I believe that's where the spirit fell upon me. Because before I had mentally assented to doctrine, I believed Jesus' teachings, but I had no will. I had some desire, but I had no will, no power to follow these teachings. So I, no, I had no, no will to follow the teachings, no power. And this preacher was saying that God never wanted to inhabit a building. From the temple, when David wanted to build it, mm -hmm. he wanted a tabernacle among the people freely. And Jesus talks about we are the body. We are the living temple. And this preacher was talking about how God doesn't want to inhabit a building. He wants to inhabit a people. I was like, man, he's speaking like some truth to me. Mm -hmm. And in that moment later, I kind of got the theological language to help me understand what I experienced. But I felt, in a sense, I don't know, condemned or convicted of the things that I was doing that weren't right in my life. And I I felt the weight of it. I felt like there were chains on my wrists and on my ankles, and I felt this weight, the weight of my own sin and brokenness, in a sense. And it, later I came to realize that that was me sitting before the judgment seat. Like, I was in the Holy of Holies. I was hmm. in the presence of God. On the A-train. On the A-train. And... In that moment, I repented. Hmm. I turned from those things. Yeah. And when I turned in my heart, I felt like those chains fall off of me. And I realized later that when I turned from the judgment seat, I was facing the mercy seat. And I got off the train and I felt so light and so free, like I could run and I did run. I remember getting off the train <laughs> and just running. And I felt like I could have like just taken off yeah. And flowing. You know how they talk about these yeah. ancient ascetics levitating? Yeah. I kind of think I know what they were experiencing because I felt that lightness of being. And I quit doing a lot of the writing that I was doing then. And I came back and I told my girlfriend, I said, uh, 
I found Jesus. She goes, you, you sound crazy. You, you, I saw you <laughs> this morning and everything was one way and now it's another way. And I ended up moving out. And um, a few months later, she came to faith too. And I started finding new work. And we got married um, within way less than a year. I don't know how long it was, but six months. Maybe it was close to a year. And um, we started, you know, living out our faith together. I've been married 12 years and got two beautiful children and doing all sorts of ministry. So how'd you end up at the Bowery? Yeah. And talk about what the Bowery mission is and uh, its history. You wrote a book about its history that I started reading last night after you gave it to me at dinner. And it's fascinating. It's the oldest homeless mission in New York City, right? Yeah. 1879? 1879. So in the last two years, we joined forces with two other rescue missions. One is called New York City Rescue Mission. Mm -hmm. And that's the oldest rescue mission in the country, 1872. But 1879, Albert and Ellen Rolfson, he was a graduate of Union Theological Seminary and a chaplain in the Union Army uh, during the Civil War. Quite a story he's got also. And um, he founded it. It was, you know, Reconstruction... It was the dregs of society were gathering along the Bowery, a really tough place. And he just opened up a prayer room, basically. Then he realized that these poor folks who needed prayer also needed coffee and rolls. So he started giving them meals. And and today we have, I believe, 11 campuses in the tri-state area. We have emergency shelter, short-term uh, employment programs, long-term recovery programs, Plus, what I'm mostly responsible for is providing direct services and pastoral support to the most vulnerable, the chronically homeless community. So where'd that mission, that that love for the downcast, the down and out, where did that come from? You know, part of it would be my my upbringing, you know, um, just how... The people that I was around growing up, how I was growing up. I have an uncle who's a year older than me. We were like brothers. And uh, he had a full ride to the UW-Madison in the biochemistry department. Mm -hmm. But he had a lot more traumatic experiences in his early childhood than I did. And when his mother passed, my grandma just brought up a lot for him. And his mental health deteriorated Mm. and he lost everything. And ended up mm. homeless, like street homeless. So whenever I see these guys, I'm like it's like my uncle, it's like my brother, it's like someone who I know is loved. And now doing this work for almost ten years, like some of these men have become like brothers to me and people I love, and who've been to my home for the holidays and stayed in our guest room, and um, and just become real, real, you know, genuine relationship with these guys. So you have three books that you've written. Yeah. Radical Spirituality. Mm-hmm. Last Stop on the Z Train. Yeah. Yeah. Which is a collection of short stories. And then the one, the brand new one about the history of the Bowery Mission. What's the title of it? Bowery Mission. Grit and Grace on Manhattan's Oldest Street. Yeah, it's got a storied history, the Bowery Mission. It's where the Red Letter Bible was founded. Mm. Louis Klopsch, 1898, asked his pastor, he was a publisher. Um, yeah. Louis Klopsch, early pioneer and visionary of photojournalism and also mission work and philanthropy. He asked his pastor, Reverend Telmage, of the original Brooklyn Tabernacle, not the current one, the one way, way back, 100 plus years. He asked his pastor, he says, what do you think if I uh, printed Jesus' words with red ink in the Bible? And Reverend Telmage said, I don't see any harm it could do and I could see a lot of great that it could do. And so that came from there. Charles Sheldon wrote In His Steps, also called What Would Jesus Do? Mm -hmm. He was part of the Christian Herald Bowery Mission for 40 plus years. J.C. Penney had his first adult faith experience in that chapel. Um, It's got a a lot of rich history. Billy Sunday is preached in the pulpit that we went by yesterday. Billy Graham as well. Uh, President Taft was there. Franklin Mm. Delano Roosevelt, when he was a governor of New York, 
came through there. Helen Keller, way back in the day. And then we have folks coming through all the time. Terry Bradshaw, you know, all sorts of folks come through. It's an interesting place where you can meet the most tender and vulnerable people who could either be homeless or a celebrity. Mm. And they all tend to come through for different reasons. And it is mutual transformation. Everyone, I believe, in a sense, if they're open to it, can be changed or impacted just by doing this work and doing this service. So how can people support the Bowery? Well, donations are always the way to go. Bowery.org forward slash donation. I, I imagine that's the URL. That's a, a primary way. But also we, we need volunteers. We need people to come down and serve meals and teach classes and do some uh, counseling and mentoring. Uh, there's a lot of need on the Bowery. So the more sisters and brothers who come together to build the kingdom, the greater impact we can have together. I can imagine the next time we come out, we'll have to have a holy smoke at the Bowery after we've spent a day serving. That would be wonderful. Get a bunch of holy smokers out here and do uh, enjoy a celebratory cigar afterwards. Oh, it'd be lovely. Jason Storbakken, the director of spiritual, what is it? Formation. Formation at the Bowery Mission and also pastor of Manhattan Mennonite Fellowship here in New York City. Thanks for being on the Holy Smokes podcast. Thank you, Steve. All right. We're going to wrap it up with some what I call rapid fire questions. Okay. Hey, everyone. Before we get to Jason's rapid fire questions, I want to talk about today's sponsor, Blinkist. Blinkist is a book summary subscription that is more than 2,500 titles in their archives. They distill key thoughts and points into easily digestible 15-minute reads. Last year, I read Abundance by Peter Diamandis and was so blown away that I ordered the full book from my public library. Then I bought it. With others like Jordan Peterson's 12 Rules for Life, I was really quite fine with only the Blinkist version. You can read in their beautifully designed mobile app at their website, export to your Kindle, or listen to the audio version on the go. I prefer to listen while I read along in bed right before I go to sleep. I fell in love with this service last year and have been turning friends on to them. And you as a listener have our word that any products or services that we advertise on the show, we will personally use and are not just fans, but raving fans. Blinkist is in that category. Try it with a seven-day free trial. And if you use our affiliate link that's in the show notes, or when you go to polysmokes.club slash blink, it's an easy way to help support all the work that Carl, Kay, myself, and my team put into keeping this show going. So please... If saving hours and hours by reading a well-written summary of some of the top business books out there sounds like something you'd want to try for seven days, click on that affiliate link, holysmokes.club slash blink. This episode is also brought to you by you. We are a nonprofit, and you can go to paypal.me slash holysmokesclub. That's paypal.me slash holysmokesclub. And there you can make a year-end tax-deductible donation to help pay for audio production and web development costs associated with this endeavor. One more time, that's paypal.me slash holysmokesclub. And as always, those links are in our show notes. Now, back to Jason Storbakken's rapid-fire questions. Rapid-fire! <laughs> Fire. Here. <laughs> Cigars or pipe? Pipe. Favorite pipe tobacco? Oh, I don't even know. I've, I've got some Bally Shag up there. I guess it, good old Bally Shag. Favorite drink to pair with your pipe? Well, I'm a, I'm a Scotty. I'm a Wisconsinite, so I'd have to say brandy old fashioned. <laughs> <laughs> the unofficial cocktail of Wisconsin. It pretty much is. Yeah, the last trip. Neil and his fiance Erica turned my wife onto a brandy old fashioned, and she, that is her favorite drink by far now. They're, they're is really is good. either a, a bourbon old fashioned or a brandy old fashioned or some sort of old fashioned. That's if, if that's on the menu, it surpassed margaritas in, in her <laughs> oh, eyes. Wow, it's a big move. <laughs> Star Wars or Star Trek? Go Star Trek. Marvel or DC? Marvel. Favorite food? Barbecue chicken. Your favorite memory? of a cigar or pipe? Probably being 16 years old in Jamaica at the Bob Marley Foundation. It wasn't tobacco. <laughs> but just sitting there with, um, you know, people who knew Bob Marley 
and my mom and stepdad allowed me to. I know this isn't rapid fire, but yeah. Um, yeah. they um, they said you may smoke here since everyone does it, and I smoked some, not a lot. I smoked some though, but it was so powerful and I was so young that I had to sit down and they're like, "Oh, sit here. This is Bob Marley's bed," <laughs> and then and then the tour guide says, "Oh." Let me go get you some herb tea. And that's when my mom really went into mother mode. She's like, he doesn't need any more herbs. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, that's the one that sticks out. Although a nice church ward, and I remember a couple of summers ago, sitting on the stoop and just reading with a nice big old church ward and pipe, reading all sorts of wonderful literature right here in Brooklyn. That was a great experience, too. If you could have a holy smoke with any three people in history... Who would they be? You can't name Jesus because everyone's going to name everyone's Jesus. Everyone's just Jesus, right? Um, Dietrich Bonhoeffer. That's a good one. Be pretty good. I feel like Dietrich Bonhoeffer would smoke a cigar. I don't know. Or, or a pipe. He but. smoked cigarettes. I know that. And I would assume also smoked pipe and probably cigars. Yeah. So I'm sure I'll get a note from some holy smoker who said, this is the <laughs> brand of cigar that he smoked. Yeah, right? So I'll say Dietrich Bonhoeffer all together, right? Yeah. All together, around right. one table. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Cornell West. Who you've met. Who, I'm, who is my advisor at Union. So Bonhoeffer. He's an interesting dude. Oh my he, I mean, goodness. he's a really interesting dude. I mean, I don't agree with some of his politics, but yet I love the fact that he is really close friends with Dr. Robert George, hmm. who is on the complete other side of the political spectrum, yet they are very, very, very dear friends. And I would just, for me, I would love to have a cigar with them and just, or a pipe or whatever, and just, just listen to the two of them talk. That'd be amazing, right? Yeah. He's so, he's really like honest. And uh, yeah, that's what I, and he's such a faithful witness, even if you disagree with his politics. I know. Yeah. He's living out as Christ's witness truly. Um, Yeah. So Bonhoeffer. Cornell West. Cornell West. And anyone in the history, I'm bringing Moses in. Interesting. You're the first. You're, you're, the, you're the first Moses guy that said Moses on this. As long as we can have that little little uh, communication device that translates all the language. Uh, <laughs> be good. All right. Last question. We're meeting one year from today. I got a bottle of champagne. What are we celebrating? We're celebrating the launch of the Brooklyn Peace Center, which is a new work and a new initiative that I'm uh, deeply engaged with in Brooklyn. The Atlantic Coast Conference, which is my church conference, has a building that has been operated as a Mennonite church for well over 60 years, and they are looking to reinvigorate that space, and they've invited my wife and I to cast the vision for it. It's less than a mile from here. So to develop the Brooklyn Peace Center as a place that promotes and embodies peace and wholeness in Brooklyn and beyond. It's a beautiful vision. Do you have any way of people to kind of learn more about that? Like an early website set up? Well, I got a URL saved, but uh, nothing going on there yet. So there will be more to come on that. We're in the advanced stages of the early stage of it. Talk a little bit about the vision of what you guys want to do there. Because I, I think it's something that's beautiful. Yeah, so the Brooklyn Peace Center will be an umbrella for a variety of agencies that meet in that physical space in Brooklyn at 23 Marcus Garvey Boulevard. Currently, the New York Mennonite Immigration Program is meeting there and providing free legal services for immigrants, documented, undocumented, and also the Garifuna Believers Mennonite Church meets there. We're going to launch another church that meets in the morning, the Brooklyn Peace Church, that will happen there. And we're going to have classes that will be accredited. I'm on the education committee for several Anabaptist seminaries. So we'll do accredited courses uh, every semester or so on conflict resolution, racial reconciliation, peace building, and then the Peace Center will have its own programming as well, uh, where you can go and hear author talks, live music, cultural events, all things that promote peace. It's beautiful. Jason, thanks for being on the Holy Smokes Podcast. Thank you, brother. <laughs>